Well, good morning, church. Happy Easter. He's risen. And yes, I got suited up for the occasion, but I've heard that you're not supposed to wear ties because a tie can attract the coronavirus and it's close to your face, and so I guess we're not supposed to be wearing ties. Although it's been a while since I've tied a tie, so I may have just forgotten how to do that. But I think that this is probably pretty good, given the fact that maybe some of you are wearing your pajamas and listening to this message. But I hope you're comfortable, and I hope, in particular, that you're well. God is working wonders in this nation and in this world. We don't always have an explanation for how God does that. But we know from history and looking back through the Bible that God does some mysterious things with tremendous outcome. And so I look forward to each and every day. It's obviously different than what we're used to, but that notwithstanding, God is in this. So have faith, church. I miss you dearly. In fact, I saw one pastor of a church who does something similar to what I'm doing, and that is we're pre-recording this on Friday, so it's Good Friday. Um, but he misses his church, and he commented about it, and so I guess some of the congregants decided to print out pictures from the directory, and then he taped the pictures on the pews so he could feel like he was at least talking to the people in the audience. So it's a little unusual, but that notwithstanding, we're just doing what we can to continue to worship together and gather together. And again, happy Easter. He's risen. Uh, the message today is called God's Friday, and I've got two different scriptures that I'd like to use to talk about God's Friday. The first is John 3, 16 and 17, a passage that all of you are probably very familiar with, because it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And the other is taken from another New Testament book, this one, the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 9 through 10. And it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. People occasionally ask me about the pronunciation of my given name. They'll ask me, well, is it Randall or is it Randall? It's kind of like the potato, potato thing. You can call me Randall, or you can call me Randall. You may call him Handel, or you may be call him Handel. Randall, Randall, Handel, Handel. Oh, let's just call the whole thing off. So just for the record, it's Randall. Not that I think I'm particularly dull, at least I hope not but it's a, obviously a family thing. Actually, going back a few generations, I could have been a stamp. You see, my paternal grandfather, Donald Stamp, a well-to-do bachelor from a very wealthy East Coast family, fell head over heels with my grandmother, whose name was Grace. The trouble is, that Grace lived across the track, so to speak. So when my grandfather's family demanded that he marry a more prominent debutante from the hood or risk being disinherited from the family, Donald did what any blue-blooded alpha male would do. He married Grace, he moved to Indianapolis, Indiana, and changed his name to John Sterling. So, I mean, at least he kept the last initial the same. And the occasional confusion over my first name has created the occasional few awkward moments. 
the most notable of which that I can recall, occurred when I appeared in court one day, and the clerk said, Randall! Then, remembering her courtroom decorum voice, she lowered her volume and said, Mr. Sterling, it's good to see you. Now, at the time, it seemed kind of rude to correct her, so I just smiled, said hello, thinking that that would be the end of it. Unfortunately, it was not. Apparently, she wanted me to meet the new bailiff in that particular courtroom and the court reporter who was present that day. So over to the table we went, and with each introduction came a mispronunciation. Hey, Joe, this is Randall Sterling. Sally, this is Randall Sterling. And I just smiled, maybe I cringed just a little bit, but I was really unable to maneuver myself into the conversation to correct her. And besides, pretty much by this time, we'd kind of reached the point of no return. Because correcting her now would have seemed probably a little embarrassing to her. So I just kept my mouth shut. But then I got trapped. You see, seconds later, the judge came in. Apparently, he had overheard the clerk's introductions to the rest of his staff, and the judge said, good to see you, Mr. Sterling. But before we proceed, I just want to clarify, <laughs> is it Randall or is it Randall? See, now I'm stuck. Because if I told the truth, the clerk would be embarrassed. But if I lied, the judge would need accuracy. She needed mercy. The court needed accuracy. And I needed to keep my license. I wanted to be kind with her, but I also wanted to be honest with him. But how, how could I do both? Well, I tried. For the first time, in my entire courtroom life, I answered, well, Your Honor, I've been called both. But frankly, I generally answer to Randy. It kind of takes the mystery out of it. May my ancestors forgive me. But that moment wasn't without its redeeming value. Because that particular situation provided me with a glimpse into what I think is God's character. Because on an infinitely grander scale, God faces with humankind what I faced with the court clerk and with the judge. How can God be both just and kind? How can God dispense both truth and mercy? How can he redeem a sinner without endorsing the sin. Can a holy God overlook our mistakes? But then can a kind God punish those same mistakes? You see, from our perspective, there are only two equally unappealing solutions. But from God's perspective, there's a third. And it's called the cross of Christ. cross. I mean, can you really turn in any direction without seeing a cross somewhere? I mean, it's perched atop maybe a chapel. It may be carved into a headstone. Maybe it's engraved on a ring or suspended from a chain. The cross is the universal symbol of Christianity. <laughs> but when you think about it, it's kind of an odd choice. Don't you think? I mean, it, it's a little odd from the standpoint because it seems a little strange that a tool of torture would come to embody a movement of hope. The symbols of other faiths are actually a lot more upbeat. I mean, take the six-pointed star of David or the crescent moon of the Islam religion or the lotus blossom of Buddhism. But a cross, 
for Christianity is like adorning an instrument of execution. I mean, for instance, would you wear a tiny little electric chair around your neck? I don't think so. Or would you hang a gold-plated hangman's noose on your wall? How about printing a picture of a firing squad on the business cards that you hand out? Yet, we do that with the cross, don't we? Many even make the sign of the cross as they pray. But would we make the sign of, let's say, a guillotine? So instead of the triangular touch of the forehead and the shoulders like so many do, how about a karate chop in the palm? I mean, doesn't have quite the same feel, does it? So why is the cross the symbol of our faith? To find the answer, church, we don't have to look any further than the cross itself. Its design could not be any simpler. One beam is horizontal. The other beam is vertical. One reaches out like God's love, and the other reaches up like God's holiness. One represents the width of God's love. The other reflects the height of his holiness. The cross, then, seems to me to be the intersection of God's love and his holiness. The cross is where God forgave his children without lowering his standards. But how, how could God do that? Well, in a sentence, God put our sin on his son and punished it there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, God put on him, referring to Jesus, the wrong who never did anything wrong, so we could be put right with God. Or, as another translation renders it, God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to envision, if you can, the moment. God is on the throne, you are on the earth, and between you and God, suspended between you and heaven, is Christ on the cross. Your sins have been placed upon Jesus, and God, punishing that sin, releases his wrath on your mistakes, and Jesus receives the blow. But since Christ is between you and God, you don't. You see, the sin is punished, but you're safe. You're safe in the shadow of the cross. That's God's Friday, or Good Friday. Christ's crucifixion viewed through the lens of an Easter Sunday morning. That's what God did. But that begs the question, why? why? Why would God do that? Did God have some sort of moral obligation to his creation? Was there some sort of heavenly obligation that he had to attend to? Maybe some sort of paternal requirement? The answer to those questions is no. God isn't required to do anything. Besides, consider what God did. He gave his son, his only son. Which begs the question, would you do that? Would you offer the life of your child for someone else? <laughs> I wouldn't. I mean, there are those for whom I would give my life, like for my family, but ask me, to make a list for those for whom I would kill my son or my daughter? 
the sheet would be blank and I would not need a pencil because that list would have no name. But God's list contains the name of every person who has ever lived and will live. That's the scope of God's love. And that's the reason for the cross. He loves the world. That's what John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only son. And aren't you glad that that verse doesn't say, well, for God so loved the rich, or for God so loved the famous, or for God so loved the thin. It doesn't. Nor does it state, for God so loved the Europeans and the Africans, or the sober and the successful, or the young or the old. It doesn't say that. When we read John 3.16, we simply read, for God so loved the world. So how wide then is God's love? It's wide enough for the whole world. And if you're in this world, then you are included in God's love. And it's nice to be included, isn't it? Because sometimes in life, we're just not. Universities exclude you if you're not smart enough. Businesses might exclude you if you're not qualified enough. And sadly, there are even some churches who will exclude you if you're not good enough. But though they may exclude you, Christ includes you. When asked to describe the width of his love, Jesus stretched one hand to the right, one hand to the left, and had them nailed in that position so that you would know how much he loved you and that he died in that place and in that configuration to show you his love for you. After World War I, the United States government had allocated funds to help care for the orphans in Europe. And at one of the orphanages, an emaciated man brought in a very thin little girl. And the man said, I would like for you to take care of my little girl, please. They asked him if the girl was his daughter, and he said, yes, she is. Oh, we're so sorry, they told him. But our rules and our policies are such that we can't take in any children who have a living parent. But I was in the prison camps during the war, he explained. And now I am too sick to work, and her mother is gone. She will die if you don't take care of her. The, offic the officials felt compassion for him. They felt some sorrow for this distressed man. But they told him that their hands were tied. There was nothing that they could do. So finally the man said, do you mean to tell me that if I were dead, you would take care of my little girl and she could have food and clothes and a home? Yes, they replied. And with that, the man picked up his little daughter, hugged on her, kissed her, he then put her hand in the hand of the man at the desk and said the following, I will arrange it. He then walked out of the orphanage and sacrificed his life so that his daughter could live. And somewhere in eternity, the day came figuratively when Jesus said to the father, do you mean that if I die, those people on earth can live and have a home with you forever? And the father said, yes. 
And with that, Jesus put our hands in the hands of the Father, walked out of heaven, was born on earth, and died on a cross to pay for our sins. You see, the cross, it's the place where the width of God's love intersects with the height of his holiness. And it's the Easter Sunday resurrection, like this morning, of the one who was murdered on the cross that then makes it such an enduring symbol of hope. The hope of Good Friday, God's Friday. Okay, but isn't there a limit to this? Surely there has to be an end to God's love. And I guess you would think so, but David the adulterer never found it. Paul the murderer never found it. Peter the liar never found it. When it came to life, these men had hit the bottom. But when it came to God's love, they never did because there is no bottom. They, like you and me, found their name on God's list of love. And you can be certain that the one who put your name on that list knows how to pronounce it because you Happy Easter, church. God bless you all. Be safe, be well, and be of great courage. God bless.